Welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Massive Late Fee. My name is Mark. With me as always is my short-haired fiance, Carol. How are you doing today, Carol? Hey, what's up? How much? It's been a good week here. It is July 25th. 1998 and you got a haircut you got them all cut <laughs> you got a haircut too i did but yeah mine was a little more drastic yeah you went from real long hair to billy jean hair billy jean to um how about uh, marilyn monroe hair no uh uh what's her name um emily valentine hair mm. from uh, it's not quite around. that short no, it's not that no. short it's not no. that short it's at all. shoulder length yeah it's just, yeah, Marilyn Monroe Ish. hair, I think, is probably appropriate. I mean, you know how it goes. You're not blonde, but... You get your hair cut, and you say shoulder length, and then it's like an inch shorter than that. <laughs> you know how it goes when <laughs> your male hairstylist doesn't listen to you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Um, it looks good, though. I like it. Thank you. I like your hair, too. Thank you. We're both feeling snazzy today. Do you like Shania Twain's hair? Uh, yeah. Well, she found success the hard way. Okay. With, with good, great hair. What? <laughs> Sitting cross-legged among scented candles, Shania Twain looks like a college student in slim black silk pants and a matching shirt. But at 32, <laughs> Twain has a lot on her mind. So she looks like a college student, but she's 32. Well, good for her. Right. Uh, I don't have time to enjoy my success, she says quietly. I'm always thinking about my future and how to take over the world. She didn't say that. And when she adds, <laughs> I feel as if I've lived three lifetimes, she isn't quoting from her new CD, Come On Over, Mercury Records. She's had more than her share of tragedy after a poverty-stricken childhood. She took on, at age 21, the responsibility of tending to three siblings. Oh, wow. When her mother and stepfather died in a car crash. Holy shit. Yet perhaps her suffering has made her success seem sweeter. I don't want to cut this off short, she says, of her career. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Canadian Twain came virtually out of nowhere to achieve astonishing success uh, popularity with her 1995 album, The Woman in Me. Well, good for her. That's sold awesome. 12 million copies and made her appearance at the Mall of America draw 20,000 fans. Wow. But now she is a... I would say she is... Firmly a pop culture star. Like, she's a pop pop singer now. Okay. She started off country. Then she's like country pop fusion. I'd say now she's she's firmly pop, wouldn't you say? Um, I don't know. I mean, she's still got that country ness to her. <laughs> yeah. Does that impress you much? <laughs> no. I See, like that, though. That song is not... In any way, country. Because mm. she says that don't impress on me much. Is it the a me? No. Is that country? What the fuck? What? She doesn't say a me like Mario. She does it's a me Mario. She does though. That don't that don't impress a me much. That's how the song goes. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You want some beanie babies? No, yeah. I, I I have too many beanie babies. Do you want to see bad um, uh, women's basketball? Please no. No offense, no offense, women's basketball players, but the WNBA is not entertaining. Okay, it's like watching high school basketball. Why? Why do you feel like the men's, you know, NBA is uh, more entertaining? They're more athletic. They can run faster, jump higher, shoot better. Wow, that's dunk. some bullshit. It's true. I mean, I thought like, you were going to be like, oh, you know, they're more aggressive and they get in fights and stuff. At least that I could see. They get in fights. <laughs> that's what I love about basketball is the fights. I don't know. I mean, they get in fights it's in not football hockey. and hockey, so. Yeah, they don't really get in fights in football either, to be honest with you. Well, they tackle each other. It's kind of fighting, right? It's true, though. They're they're more athletic. But why does that make it more entertaining? Because they can do more amazing things. Since they can jump higher, they can do like like more amazing dunks, layups, 
stuff like that. Since they shoot better, they're more efficient. Since they can run faster, the game has a, a faster pace. Okay. I mean these these women could beat the fuck out of me in basketball. I'm not saying, right. I'm not saying they're. I'm not saying they suck. But when you compare them against the greatest basketball players in the world, the ones that play in the NBA, they're not nearly as good. So it's not nearly as good of a product. Interesting. I think pretty much. I think a mid tier. Um, a mid-tier college men's college team could probably beat a team of WNBA All-Stars. That's huh? just a difference in the sexes. That doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, women's tennis is as exciting or even more exciting in some ways than men's tennis. Soccer, same thing. Those aren't um, sports that require as much physical dominance you know what i mean like basketball basketball football they require physical dominance baseball tennis soccer not as much so that's i think that's the difference Ten, female tennis is actually probably more exciting than male tennis because of the lack of power because male tennis is reliant on very um strong serves and stuff like that and short rallies Whereas since they don't serve the ball as fast, the female rallies tend to last longer and be more entertaining. So, ladies, it's um, late fee, 1994 at AOL.com. Yeah, I mean, if you'd if, like to tell Mark what an asshole he is. If you want to complain, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the complaint is. I'm not saying that women aren't athletic. I'm not saying that I'm not stating anything other than facts. Okay. On average, men are more athletic than women. They're built differently than women. On average. Okay. Yeah. Why? What brought that to your mind? Oh, uh, if July 25th, the day this is, if uh, you go to the WNBA game, the shock game, uh, they're giving away free Beanie Babies. <laughs> so anybody that wants some free... What the fuck? Like- anyone that wants free Beanie Babies that lives in our area... Go out to a Detroit shock game. I'm sure you can find tickets. I think it is hilarious that you were trying so hard to find like a transition into this that you asked me those two questions and then never transitioned appropriately. <laughs> Just started talking shit about women's basketball. You derailed me. Because I said I have enough Beanie Babies. Cause I no, because you started asking me about women's basketball. I didn't whatever. ask you shit about. Women's I didn't basketball. volunteer like you. Why they're not? It's not as good as W as the NBA. Your face. <laughs> you're you know so one thing. Weird. You know one thing that it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Uh, gender doesn't play a role in how good you are at it. Chess, acting, true, and that also chess. And there's no greater display of that than in the movie we saw this week. <laughs> disturbing behavior. Okay, I'll give you that segue. That was there good. was dis- some disturbing acting. In this movie, but not by the female lead. <laughs> yeah, we got to see our very own Joey Potter, uh-huh. no, Katie Holmes, uh, playing one of the leads in the movie. Yes, Catherine Holmes, or Catherine Houses is her full name. It is not. <laughs> the fuck? You're so weird. She was excellent in she the movie. Was. And she's... She has such a like expressive face, mm-hmm. I lo- and I love when her eyes get all like big. Like uh, I don't know. <laughs> there were many things in the movie that required big eyes. What a professional <laughs> review of this Fuck movie! You, I like when her movies get. Ah. <laughs> You're such an ass. I don't think men are late in- fee nineteen ninety four at aol I don't think men are inherently better at movie reviews than women. But <laughs> I think. There might be a discrepancy in this particular <laughs> booth. Goodness. Anyway, so we watched Disturbing Behavior, which is essentially a remake of The Stepford Wives. Oh, really? I've never seen The Stepford Wives. So. Well, I mean, not really, but there's there's some allusions to The Stepford Wives in the movie. And yes, the plot is very similar. Hmm. A In The Stepford Wives, a couple moves to a new town where... All the women are 
prim and proper homemakers. They, you know, cater to to their men and all this stuff and everything. And this movie came out in the 70s, like during mm-hmm. the midst of the women's liberation movement. And it was like, um, what the fuck? Like, what is going on? Why, why are all the women like this in this little town? This, doesn't this seem weird? And like women would be, they'd come in being independent or whatever, burning their bras and stuff like that. And then convert to all of a sudden like i baked cookies mm-hmm. and it turns out that one of the men it's been a long time since i've seen it I, like one of the men or a group of the men in the town is essentially brainwashing them okay into being this like 50s and it's 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 a very clear social commentary on right. the stuff going on at the time and there's a lot of political undertones to it. It's a very good movie, actually. I don't think there were any political undertones to this movie, though. Um, I mean, I suppose they... The thing is, is it's hard to say because the idea itself is rife with political undertones. <laughs> and you could try to shoehorn apply some here, like about... Uh, the individuality of teenagers and th- they should be allowed to express themselves and stuff like that. And too often, school tries to be conformist and fit you into a certain role, whether it's jock or nerd or, or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like the, the Breakfast Club and stuff like that uh, kind of touched on in a more generic, or not generic, a more... Um, organic and like meaningful way but you could try to do that but no i don't think that there's really a i don't think there's really a um that message here and not not one that's intended anyway so in this movie we Mm. do have a family moving just like the stepford wives where it's a um mom and dad and their two kids teenage boy and james marsden and uh Stevie is his name. Mm-hmm. And then, well, was she a teenager? His little sister, she's in middle school, so. Yeah, I think like eighth grade or something like that. Yeah. So she's probably like 13. And we find out through the movie that um, they had a brother who died. And that's probably Suddenly, why they moved. Sudden Ethan Embry. Just all of a sudden, he's like, he falls asleep, and it's just like home movies, and it's like sudden Ethan Embry. You know what it reeks of, <laughs> Like too? suddenly Susan. It, yeah, exactly. It, well, you know what it reeks of, too? It reeks of... We definitely filmed more of this Mm -hmm. than we released. Right. Like, there were some cuts to this movie. And this movie feels schizophrenic. It does. It feels like it wants to be an X-Files type thing. Like, uh, you know, whatever. And then it feels like it wants to be uh, a monster of the week, like, Buffy or Scream (laughs) style thing, too. Right. Right. I don't know. Um, what? I didn't like it. Did you? I okay. So there are a lot of things I didn't like about it, but there were a lot of things I did like about it. Okay. So I feel I'm torn on it. I mean, like I enjoyed some of the scenes, mm-hmm. but overall, I feel like. I mean, in the beginning of the movie, the acting didn't seem great. Uh, the, the, yeah, the beginning of the movie, the acting wasn't good. The people that play... So, the basic plot of the movie is there's a group, they call them the Blue Ribbon Gang or Club or whatever. The, yeah, Blue Ribbon Club. Uh, that's in the school. And it's made up of mostly like jocks and straight A students, like the goody but, good, the goody goodies. But they weren't. That's not what it's made up of initially. They just... Turn them into that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's important. It's not like, okay, oh, this but is just l- a bunch of good kids that got together. Uh-huh, but let me finish my point. <laughs> Sorry. So there's a bunch of them, and they're jocks and goody goodies and stuff like that. And they go to the, the yogurt shop, <laughs> and they're playing 50s music, which juxtaposes with the... the Current, Fantastic yeah, soundtrack, yeah. yeah. That, they're, that they're playing outside of this yogurt shop, right? And everyone that's in that group is not a great actor or actress. But here's the thing. Are they not, or are they supposed to look that, like, flat and subdued and stuff? Maybe. I mean, maybe that's what they're doing. 
But if that's what it is, then that's bad directing. Okay. Then the director gave them the steered them wrong because they do, it doesn't come across. It just comes across as bad acting. It doesn't come across as oh, there's something wrong with this person. I want to talk about one of the first scenes of this movie, though. Sure. There's a jock sitting in a car at, like, make-out point or whatever with Uh some girl. Yeah. And she's kissing on him, and she wants to go down on him. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, I need my fluids. Yeah. What in the actual fuck? How could that be a response to anything? Like, I need my fluids? Like, I thought they're aliens. And they needed fluid or something. Like, they never go back to that. Like, why does he need his fucking fluids? So. (laughs) (laughs) It's weird. Once again, sorry sorry to talk about sports, everyone. I guess this is going to be a sports-heavy episode. There is a misnomer in the sporting community. Because he says, I have a game. I need Mm -hmm. my fluids. There's a misnomer in the sporting community that having sex before a game will take your legs out, will, you know, like sap you of your energy and and stuff like that. Okay. So you're not supposed to have sex or masturbate or anything like that before a a big game. It's not actually scientifically proven, so it's not real, but that's what he was saying. He was also, I'm sure, trying to stop that from happening because the mind control chip in his brain is telling him, don't have premarital sex. Right. Don't have premarital sex. Right. Although, why is this jock dating this chick that's like, she's like a punk chick or something like that? Well, the, remember the other guy was all into Katie Holmes. Yeah, but I mean, come on, it's Katie Holmes. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just saying, I feel like they were still attracted to people yeah. who weren't blue ribbon. Yeah, he, uh, he <clears throat> looks at Katie Holmes and all of a sudden his eye gets like super red and there's like there's a target like on her body and like his vision gets all like blurry and flashy and stuff like that and i'm just like why are they just showing what normally happens to men when they look at Katie Holmes? <laughs> Shut up. like i don't understand this and then it took me a minute to be like oh it's a symptom see and then i thought like they're robots of some kind because yeah. the red glowing light and like the weird vision change, like I thought, yeah. okay, I thought that too for a minute. But no, they're they're not aliens. They're not robots. They're just fucked in the head. Yeah, they're just <laughs> by a doctor. They're just some. And so here's the thing. Supposedly, I was reading a, a article in Van, in uh, um, I almost said Vanity Fair, which is not correct, but Variety. I was reading an article in Variety about this movie, and apparently. There's a, like, two-hour and ten-minute cut of this film. The movie's, like, 85 minutes long. Uh, But apparently there's, like, a two-hour and ten-minute cut of this film that does a lot more characterization. There's a sex scene between James Marston and Katie Holmes. Uh, That would have made more sense, because they're all, like, kissing Mm -hmm. and shit at the end. I'm like, when did this happen? Yep. There's So there's a lot more of that stuff, and apparently the studio is, like, Teenagers are not going to sit through a two-hour long film. What? About this. I would have sat through the two-hour long. I would have happily sat through the two-hour long film. I would have sat through a two-hour long sex scene between <laughs> right and James Marsden. But um, but no. So so they they wanted to cut it down. So that's there were a lot of cuts apparently made. That the director didn't really love. Well, they didn't do a great job with the. Editing. I'd love to see the director's cut. To yeah. Be, to be honest with you, I would love to see the director's cut of this movie. Yeah, but, for sure. Um, so I think that explains some of the problems that I have with the movie. Because we don't get a ton of characterization, so it's hard to really know where a lot of these characters are coming from other than being stock characters. Katie Holmes' character is completely underwritten. Yeah. We don't know anything about her, and the only reason that her character works at all is because Katie Holmes is... By factor of, like, ten, the best actor in this movie, and charming as hell. Yes. And she she carries the parts of the movie she's in, she carries on her back. Every part of the movie she's in is much better than any part of the movie she's not in. Agreed. Agreed. Like, yeah, I mean, all we know about her really is what's, like, the wardrobe tells us. I mean... yeah. And, you know, she keeps saying razor. (laughs) 
is that a thing in like I don't know the West Coast or something that we don't know about? I think think they're trying to make it a thing. It's ridiculous sounding. Yeah, that's the other thing too. Is I think this movie is supposed to take place around like Seattle area, like Puget Sound area, um, Vancouver Island esque area. This movie was filmed in Vancouver. Vancouver has a lot of tax incentives for movies. Hmm. Um, Famously. Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason takes Manhattan. Uh, Vancouver doubles for Manhattan because they can't. They, Interesting. It's very expensive to film in New York City. <laughs> so, Wow. I can't imagine Vancouver looks anything like New York City. It does not. Okay. <laughs> and it shows up very much in the movie. They have one. They shot one day in Times Square. And there is a, a, an iconic shot of Jason like... In Times Square, which is amazing, but yeah, the it, movie fails because it's mostly on a cruise ship, and then like the very last of it takes place in Vancouver. <laughs> Why not just Jason takes Vancouver? <laughs> that could be a thing. <laughs> they had grand plans for it. They were gonna have he was gonna have a he was gonna have a boxing match in Madison Square Garden. Uh, the Statue of Liberty was gonna be part of it. Like they had all these plans, and then. Uh, they 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 brought all these plans to Paramount and Paramount's like we're not paying for this. <laughs> we're making Indiana Jones films. This is a fucking this is trash that, right. that we make for like two million dollars and it, it it brings its money back in. We don't want, we're not paying for any of that. So they did not do it. I couldn't imagine though like us a, uh, a Friday the Thirteenth movie where they pour like seventy million dollars into a budget right. would be amazing. <laughs> So in this movie, which mm. probably had much less of a budget. Uh, oh, for sure. Like, I don't know. There was just a lot of things that just did not work. Um, yeah. For example, they go to a psychiatric hospital. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this makes no, this whole scene makes no sense. First of all, I, I would like this to ha- believe. This has to be part of the stuff they cut out. Right. Because it doesn't make any sense. Because I would have to believe that there would be some sort of security that they would have to get through before they're wandering around with the patients. We don't even see them go in the building. No. Let alone get around security or anything like that. They're just, all of a sudden, there's a cut and the next scene, they're just wandering around the where like cells or whatever yeah. where these people are being like locked in their rooms it's very disorienting it is and like and, and we- all these people are freaks of some kind and like they don't there's no they needed the scene where they found the paper that says like uh you know subject is like whatever like you know we're getting closer to our you know making kids per- perfect or whatever like you know like they needed the scene where they found that information in mm-hmm. this thing, and that's not in the scene. Yeah. They, they never find anything. Yeah, they act like they figured out the key to everything because they discover that the evil doctor that's doing this on their island mm-hmm. has his daughter as a patient yeah. that he obviously fucked up right. in this hospital. But it doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything to move the plot forward. It does nothing to help them realize anything. And... The only thing that happens is when they're dealing with him later, they taunt him about it a little bit, and he's just like, oh, she wasn't that smart anyway. Yeah. Like, who gives a fuck about this kid? Right. And it's like, oh, all right. Well, whatever. So it was like a wasted scene. If they're going to, like, cut shit out, like, cut the whole thing out then, you know, because it didn't make any fucking sense anyway. Just refilm a different scene where they find that information. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, like I said... They, that scene needed a p- part where they find the paper that, like, it's like his diary or something mm. like that, where he's, like, uh, you know, had another setback today. You know, the chip is doing this or whatever to their brains and it's like, have to work this problem out. But, you know, we'll make sure that we get rid of, we eradicate teen pregnancy and drugs and violence or whatever it is he's trying to do. Because that's the other thing. We don't know his motivation at all. Right. Like, what is his motivation in brainwashing kids? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we're even making an assumption that he's trying to make them better. Yeah. Is like, he creating an army? <laughs> right. Is he saying, Asalaamu Alaikum, become part of my new nation? <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Yeah, it's it's really fucked up. Now, there are, on their own, in like 
a little capsule, there are some scenes that are kind of interesting or funny. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Like, the scene when um, our main character, Stevie, comes Stevie. home and finds the blonde bombshell blue ribbon girl mm-hmm. waiting for him, wanting to fuck him. She undoes her shirt. We see boobs. So, you yeah. know, that's one reason to see the movie. Katie Holmes and her breasts. Um, but not Katie Holmes' No, unfortunately breasts. not Katie Holmes' breasts. Um, and then when he rejects her, she starts bashing her head into a mirror. Because <laughs> she's like, I know it's wrong, wrong. And like she, she yeah, fucking... It's like, like a computer glitching. Yeah, exactly. I thought, again, robots. <laughs> I was expecting her to come away like the Terminator. Well, with I guess like she's... A piece of her face. She expected to come. Uh, <laughs> but so I think maybe they're part robot now because of this chip in their brain. Who knows? Yeah. it's And like, yeah. With the 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 janitor discovered this weird frequency that causes them to freak out. Yeah, because he's trying to hurt the rat's ears. I think that's just a cover. I think he was always trying to fuck with them, not the rats. So you think that he knew that this was going on the whole time? Yeah, he's pretending to be like mentally challenged, and he's not. Yeah. And he saves our main characters at some point. The a couple f- points, actually. The guy from Shawshank Redemption, William Sattler. Huh. What did he do in Shawshank? He was just one of the guys that was imprisoned with Andy. Okay. But, um, yeah, I think one time, though, when he does this frequency, they're, like, twitching funky, like like they're aliens or robots or something. Like, mm. they don't look like people. Yeah, I don't. And that's the problem is it, it's, it's like an invasion of the body snatchers mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yes. But, and maybe that would have been more interesting if we found out that, the leader guy was like some sort of alien and he was trying to slowly take over the world. But and yeah. it would have made the ending would have made more sense then and would have been apparently it's a reshot ending too, and would have made more um, of an impact. Than yeah, it does. Cause at the end, I mean, spoilers, I guess we're kind of going all over the place. With Sorry this. guys. At the end, Gavin, the, the burnout dude that Stevie first befriends when he moves in there with his albino friend. Was he an albino? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, he um, he gets turned into one of these blue ribbons. Mm-hmm. And ostensibly, James Marsden kills all of them at the end with William Sattler's help. However, at the very end of the movie, Gavin, as a blue ribbon, comes back in. He's a student teacher now. And he's teaching this inner city school filled with black kids. And I guess the implication is that he's going to spread this. But how? Yeah. Like, this dude, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but this guy. The doctor? The doctor guy was an actual brain surgeon. Right. Dude. Like, he, he had neuroscience experience. And... A shadowy team of assistants that were all adults that all wore glasses like it's fucking they live or something like that. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck's going on there. Right. But uh, how? why are they all going with it? Just like a cabal of, <laughs> I mean, it's fucking weird. But anyway, um, so you can buy, okay, this guy knows what he's doing because he knows neuroscience. Gavin doesn't. So what's he going to do? He's going to perform surgery on these kids? Yeah, well, I kind of, I, I thought maybe the doctor somehow survived, cause, no, since Gavin didn't. survived. He didn't, though. Because they both fell down the same hole, or over the same cliff. I don't think Gavin was there, because we don't actually see Gavin fall okay. down the hole. So I think the implication is Gavin didn't fall down there. And and that's how they get rid of them all, is that this Jander dude is blaring this awful sound that they hate, and they mm-hmm. all just throw their bodies on his car and attack it. Yeah, it's like, the Pied Piper. <laughs> Like, they're, like, fucking animals or something. Like, mm-hmm. it's stupid. It is dumb. And then he roll, runs his car over the edge, and then they like, go, oh, they're all dead. Yep. The worst part to me, though, about the movie. They have very, the ending with the with them? Yeah. The, the, okay, our main it's character, so Steve, before they try to turn him into the Blue Ribbon, he's trying to take his sister mm-hmm. and go back to Chicago, and his parents stop him, and then they're trying to turn him into the Blue Ribbon. Right. The end of the movie, he takes his sister... With the with, albino guy and, and Katie, Katie Holmes. Holmes, and they get on the ferry. They're leaving this island, and they're gonna go just 
be he's a like, family. He's like, we're just we're gonna go home, and she's Katie Holmes. Like, where's home? And he's like, wherever we want it to be. And it's like, doesn't Katie Holmes have parents? Right? <laughs> Don't you have parents? Like, yeah. You just, that's it. You're just done. You like, kill. You killed all of them. Who cares now? And the sound is safe again. Supposedly, yeah. And like the parents didn't know. It's not like the parents are evil. Right. I mean, they had a little bit of family conflict that we knew about because of his suicide. You know, brother thing. His brother committed suicide because he wasn't blue ribbon enough. <laughs> and and his parents won't let him talk about it. So, like, yeah, okay, there's some unhappiness. Sure. But he's going to run away and take his sister? That's not cool. And he's also guilty of kidnapping now, too. Right? Like, And that, and he's going to cross state lines, so that's a federal crime. So, yeah, three, three different families torn asunder. <laughs> Four. Well, plus all those dead kids. Oh, three. Yeah. I mean, the whole town. It's just awful. Yeah. I guess maybe they're leaving because they might be wanted for murder now. I don't know. But they didn't kill them. No, William Sattler did. With his Pied Piper thing. Exactly. But yeah, so the ending I thought was really dumb. Yeah, I mean, there was just so much of the movie that was dumb and so many things that aren't properly explained, like you said. So it's like the whole movie, it's it's just confusion. It's it's a confusion. So the movie is weird because on one hand, it's very simple. It's a very simple plot line, for like almost too simple, from point A to B to C to D. But also it's super confusing because they don't... The only way you really get point A, B, C, and D is by filling in the gaps yourself, by seeing movies before, being like, oh, okay, well, in a normal movie, they'd explain this, so I know this is happening. And then they explain this, so I know this is happening. <laughs> but in the logic of the movie, it's like everyone's leaping from one thing to the next. It's like... They said, we need this to happen, this to happen, that to happen. So this happens, and then this happens, and then that happens. Instead of saying, this happens, therefore, this happens. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there's not enough cause and effect, for Mm. sure. Yeah. It's very weird. It's, yeah, it's, but there, so the costuming, I thought was fantastic yeah they did a really good job with the costume the soundtrack is phenomenal amazing i'll probably buy the soundtrack yeah for sure the cd um katie holmes was was wonderful in the movie like really a i mean she's sort of typecast i guess as a uh as a teenager as a kid from the wrong (laughs) side of the tracks in a seaside community i guess yeah but no this character is very different than joey potter yeah and she's She's very good in the movie. Yeah, the acting on her part and James Marsden was fine also. Yeah, Gavin's good too. Mm-hmm. Nick Stoll. I liked the albino friend. He was funny. Yeah. But I wouldn't recommend the movie. I'm sorry. I just can't. Like, I mean, it's an experience, I guess, but. The movie has a certain mood. Yeah. The thing that I think it. The thing that I think it gets right is atmosphere. Sure. The movie has good tone and atmosphere throughout. The pacing's quick. Mm-hmm. The, Too quick. There's, yeah, there's not, there's not enough development. They need that time back that they cut, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, for it to make it into a complete film. But... It really, it does get tone and atmosphere really good. Um, but yeah, a lot of it fails <laughs> from a logical point of view. And like I said, unfortunately, I think a lot of that is the, the, the editing. Yeah. I think it's a poorly edited film. And I'm just, I'm disappointed because like the, the trailer made it look really good. Oh, yeah. And I was really excited and hopeful and... Yeah, I thought it was going to be a cool kind of sci-fi horror movie. Yeah. And I was on board. Teenage yeah. sci-fi horror movie. But, I mean, it is a teenage sci-fi horror movie. It's just not a it's good not one. not a good one, yeah. <laughs> it, needed, it needed a tighter script and better editing. And more breasts. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that would, that's always good. Uh, but, yeah, that's the... Uh, we need more breasts on this show. I have plenty of breasts right here. No, I know, but I mean, they're not, they're covered. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> we can fix that later. Right. Well, that is the episode, Kara. I'll tell them where to see your breasts. 
Oh my goodness. So uh, you can go to our website where my breasts are not at uh, www.retrolatefee.com. Mm-hmm. Again, you can write us and tell Mark he's an asshole at latefee1994awol.com. Uh-huh. And share the tapes with your friends. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.